Welcome to the Georgia Southern Museum. This museum was founded by the college in 1980 and is dedicated to becoming a fine teaching museum for the region. The museum is open to the public six days a week and a trained staff is available to answer your questions about the displays. As you walk around the museum's Hall of Natural History, you'll notice that many of our display cases contain a number of fossil specimens. These fossils help us understand what living creatures looked like thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of years ago in this region of Georgia. The largest fossil on exhibit in the Hall of Natural History is the 26-foot-long Mosasaur. Many people mistakenly think that the Georgia Southern Mosasaur is a dinosaur, but it is not a dinosaur. Our Mosasaur lived during the age of dinosaurs, but dinosaurs were land creatures, where Mosasaurs were fully aquatic and swam about in ancient seas. If you look closely at our Mosasaur skeleton and compare it to a dinosaur, you will notice that the skull and jaw bones are arranged differently from those of a dinosaur. Notice that the arms and legs of the Mosasaur are both shaped differently and located in a different position than those of a dinosaur. In fact, our Mosasaur is more closely related to a snake or a lizard than to a dinosaur. This Mosasaur is 78 million years old and lived during the geologic time period called the Cretaceous period. Our Mosasaur was collected in South Dakota from a geologic formation called the Pierre Shale which contains many other fossils, including abundant shells, plesiosaurs, turtles, birds, and several types of mosasaurs. During the Cretaceous period, a large shallow seaway extended across central North America and connected the bodies of water we now know as the Arctic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. Although this fossil is from South Dakota, mosasaurs of this type have been found along the Gulf Coast region in states such as Texas and Alabama. Thus, this specimen is certainly relevant to Southeast Georgia. The purpose of this program is to explain how large fossils, such as our Mosasaur, are collected and subsequently prepared and displayed as you see them today. The steps involved with this process include researching the history of the area, prospecting for a fossil specimen, collecting and documenting the find, curation and preparation of the specimen, and exhibiting the specimen. Researching the history of the study area. Just as an anthropologist might look at ancient writings and crumbled buildings to better understand the history of man, the geologist examines sequences of rocks and fossils to better understand the history of the earth. A fossil is any direct or indirect evidence of prehistoric life. It can be the bone of an ancient reptile, the shell of an ancient clam, or even the tracks, trails, or burrows of animals that once moved through the settlement. Creatures with hard parts, such as bones or shells, are more likely to occur as fossils than creatures with just soft parts. Fossils form in the following manner. A creature lives and dies and drops to the sea bottom. Fine grain sediment filters down and buries the bones of the dead animal. Over time, the sediment accumulates to great thicknesses and hardens to form rock. After thousands of years, the fossil-bearing rock may then be uplifted, eroded, and exposed at the surface, thus making the fossil bones available for collection. When such rocks are uplifted and exposed at the surface, they may be altered and decomposed. If the climate is dry and there is not much vegetation, the rocks are not severely weathered. In humid climates, where there is lots of rain, the rocks are highly weathered and covered with abundant vegetation, thus making good exposures and well-preserved fossil specimens hard to find. Fossils are typically found in sedimentary rocks. Weathered rock material erodes from mountains and hills, gets carried by streams and rivers to lowland areas, and then the sediment is deposited in streams, lakes, or on the ocean bottom. Fossils are often found in sedimentary rocks like sandstone, shale, or limestone. Sediments are usually deposited in horizontal layers that are laterally extensive over long distances. It is important that the rock formation be easily recognized from the overlaying and underlaying rock units so the geologists can locate outcrops of this particular unit. To help with this, geologists use specially prepared maps called 
geologic maps that identify the name and age of rock formations in different areas. Finally, the geologist must study the life habits of the fossil he is looking for and understand what types of sediment the creature is most likely to be found in. For example, the Georgia Southern Mosasaur was a marine reptile that swam about in ancient seas. It was found in the Pierre Shale, a dark gray marine shale rock. This rock formation contains many other types of fossils such as sea turtles, clams, snails, and large marine reptiles that all lived in the sea together with our Mosasaur about 78 million years ago. Prospecting for a fossil specimen. Once the geologic history of an area is understood and the pertinent geologic maps have been studied, the geologist can go into a selected study area and begin searching or prospecting for a particular fossil. This involves obtaining permission from landowners such as South Dakota rancher Tom Conger. For years, geologists have prospected and collected fossils from the Conger ranch land. We asked Tom how he feels about this. I feel kind of good being able to cooperate with with Jim and the school minds and, and anybody that's uh, doing this kind of work for, you know, I want to call it the benefit of science or whatever you want to call it, something of that nature. And, and we're uh, we're glad to cooperate and provide access to to the groups. Uh, we kind of like to have them pay attention to the gates and, and watch out for fire and not just their hands around it. You know what I mean? But other than that, as far as being in in, in our way with uh, what we do with the, the land here, it, it doesn't cause any problems. This, uh, these shale deposits are very poor country in respect to being, this is about really the only use there is for them, is to, to find the fossils in them. We decided to get a first-hand look at what prospecting is all about, so we went into the field prospecting at the Henderson Ranch with geologist Dr. James Martin from the South Dakota School of Mines. Dr. Martin told us that successful prospecting requires, one, taking the time and energy to cover a wide area, two, looking over the rocks carefully, three, having the patience to keep looking, and fourth, very importantly, good old-fashioned luck. After a specimen is found, the bones are carefully exposed with a paintbrush, awls, and rock picks. Once its outline has been determined, it is usually covered over with plastic sheets and rock debris to prevent further weathering and deterioration. The specimen's location is also marked on a map and described in the field notebook so that future geologists and other scientists will know exactly where the specimen was found. The geologist can go back later, find the locality, and collect the specimen when he has both the time and the proper collecting equipment. Collecting and documenting the find. Many large fossils are collected in sections by building a plaster cast around the fossil bones and surrounding rock material, and then taking the cast back to the museum or laboratory for final preparation. This method is used because it takes a lot of time to carefully extract fossil bones from rock matrix, and this job is best performed indoors where the changing climate and seasons will not hamper or hinder the work being done. The actual collection of a fossil takes days, weeks, or even months. During the summer of 1987, Georgia Southern geologist Dr. Gail Bishop and a group of Georgia Southern geology students went out to South Dakota for a field geology class. While there, the students helped Dr. Martin collect part of a small mosasaur that had been found earlier that summer. Only part of the specimen was actually exposed at the surface, but the entire specimen was later found to be in the rock layers just below the ground surface. First, Dr. Gail Bishop explains the geologic history of the area. We're located here about two miles south of the town of Buffalo Gap, South Dakota, in southwestern South Dakota, on the flank of the Black Hills uplift. The rocks that we're in here are called the Pier Shale. These shales are approximately 80 million years old and used to be the bed of an ancient ocean that stretched from Texas up to the Arctic area of Canada. The shorelines here probably would have been placed approximately 300 miles directly behind me and some two or 300 miles directly in front of me here. These rocks uh, 
are dark marine shales deposited on the seabed. Alternating with the dark gray shales are some orangish layers of volcanic ash that we now call bentonite. There's very little rainfall. We're in an arid environment, and the uh, rocks themselves are therefore not covered by vegetation and are not deeply weathered. Therefore, we have this very fine surface exposure of the ancient ocean bed that was deposited some 80 million years ago. Within these beds, we find both gray shales and volcanic ash beds, which tend to be yellow in color in this part of the section. Interbedded with the shales, we find abundant fossils of large vertebrate animals, such as mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, pterodactyls, turtles, fish, and many other large vertebrates that lived up in the water mass. De While collecting the fossil, the field party of students used the same techniques that were used to collect the GSC mosasaur eight years earlier. Their task was to collect a block of rock which contains the two front paddles of the small mosasaur. The rest of the mosasaur skeleton is present just below the ground surface and has been covered over with rock material to help protect the bones while we work until the geologist are ready to collect the rest of the fossil. A trench was dug around the paddles to isolate them from the rest of the skeleton. The shale rock in this area is fairly soft and easily removed. This specimen was found close to the ground surface and only a few inches of overburden had to be removed. The next step involved building the plaster jacket. Wet tissue paper was first laid down on the bones to keep the plaster from actually touching the bone surfaces then thin plaster bandages, and finally thick burlap strips dipped in liquid plaster were placed over the bones. It's necessary to fit the plaster bandages tightly around the bones so the bones don't shift when the cast is moved. The cast took about 30 minutes to dry, and then Dr. Martin documented his find. In his field notebook, he identified what was collected and where it was found, both geographically and stratigraphically. He placed a north arrow on the cast so that this fossil's orientation would be known. He also labeled and numbered the cast so that he would know what it contained once it was back in the museum. The dry cast was dug up, rolled over, and then a plaster layer was put on the underside to completely seal in the fossil. If this cast was built correctly and tightly around the bones and rock material, the paddle bones of this mosasaur would be protected and safe from further destruction. The dried cast can now be carried back to the museum where the actual preparation will be done sometime in the near future. And of course, the geologists will have to come back out later to this site and collect the rest of the specimen. While we were out in South Dakota during the summer of 1987, we returned to the Henderson Ranch where the GSC Mosasaur was collected back in 1979. Dr. Martin walks around the spur of land that once contained our Mosasaur. When the Georgia Southern Mosasaur specimen was collected, the field party had to excavate down to the level of the bones. In all, about 30 feet of outcrop and four feet of overburdened rock had to be removed. The collecting party had divided the skeleton into parts because it was too large to be moved as one piece. When the collecting process was finished, there were 13 casts, and the largest cast weighed about 600 pounds. Preparation and curation of the specimen. Once the cast of the specimen were transported to Georgia Southern, preparation and curation of the fossil began. This phase may take months or even years, depending upon the size and condition of the fossil and how much time the geologist has to work on the specimen. The plaster jackets were opened and workers carefully chiseled and brushed away the rock material to reveal the pieces of bone in each cast. As each bone fragment was uncovered, its outline was drawn on a scaled map of the cast so the exact position of the various bones would always be known. The bones were labeled, given an identification number, and placed in cabinets for storage. This careful documentation was necessary so the fragments of one bone would not get rearranged and confused with fragments of other bones. In this manner, each bone was systematically removed from the rock matrix. Only later were the individual fragments of the bone refitted back together to make up complete pieces of the mosasaur skeleton. As this time-consuming task continued, it soon became apparent that although our mosasaur was very complete, many of the larger bones had been crushed under the weight of thousands of feet of overburden 
during its 78 million years of burial. As the work continued, several interesting discoveries were made. Georgia Southern paleontologist Dr. Richard Petowick, who conducted and supervised the work on the Georgia Southern Mosasaur, discovered that our Mosasaur was afflicted with arthritis. Here he is shown comparing an arthritic bone to a regular healthy bone. He also discovered these small bones in the stomach cavity of our Mosasaur. These bones have been identified as part of the remains of a smaller Mosasaur, probably the last meal our Mosasaur ate before he died. Geologists have found stomach contents in other Mosasaurs as well. For example, the South Dakota School of Mines has a Mosasaur specimen whose stomach contents include fish bones, bird bones, shellfish fragments, as well as bone fragments of several different types of Mosasaurs. Using this information, we now know that Mosasaurs ate just about anything and everything. Museum preparator Brian Meyer assisted Dr. Petterwick in reconstructing the Mosasaur skeleton. One of Brian's many contributions was rebuilding the Mosasaur's skull, which had been crushed millions of years ago when the muddy sediment was turned to shale rock and the fossil was still buried deep underground. Brian rebuilt the skull by molding pieces of the original skull in latex, casting the molds in plaster of Paris, and then placing the casted pieces onto the replacement skull in their proper position. This job involved a thorough understanding of both the structure and the function of the various bones within the skull. In addition to molding parts of our Mosasaur's crushed skull to make the cast pieces, Brian also utilized drawings of Mosasaur skulls from books and journal articles about Mosasaurs. He also examined well-preserved skulls of Mosasaur specimens on exhibit in other museums. Using such care, he very accurately and faithfully created an exact replica of the Georgia Southern Mosasaur skull. Because some of the other real bones were severely crushed and not appropriate for display purposes, plaster of Paris replicas of these bones were also used for the exhibit you see today. However, as you look at our specimen, you should realize that you are seeing about 75% real bone material on exhibit and only about 25% plaster replicas. This is almost twice the amount of real bone you would typically expect to see for a specimen of this size. It took many years for the geologist to accurately reconstruct the Mosasaur skeleton. As the rebuilt bones were completed, they were laid out on the museum's exhibit platform for display. Eventually, the skeleton was completely rebuilt and the exhibit phase began. Exhibiting the specimen. The geologist selected a free hanging mount to display our Mosasaur. To use this type of mount, months of very careful planning and accurate calculation had to be done first. The Mosasaur bones were weighed and scaled sketches of the structure and skeleton were drawn to see if this plan would really work. To create the supporting structure, cooperation was needed between technology and geology. When the supporting steel structure was finally hung by cables from the ceiling, it gleamed under the museum lights like a fine piece of artwork. A variety of pieces of equipment were designed to suit the geologist's needs, such as this machine, which helped the workers glue delicate pieces of the vertebrae together. Some bones had to be rebuilt from plaster to accommodate this type of mount. Steel plates were placed in the jaws and skull of the Mosasaur head so that they could withstand the stress of being displayed with very little support. To get the Mosasaur bones onto the suspended structure, the backbones had to be drilled to fit onto the steel hanging rods. Each bone was carefully fitted onto the rods and then glued into place section by section. The rib cage and paddles were the last sections to be added to the Mosasaur display. Finally, the geologists had completely reassembled what 78 million years in the ground had slowly broken apart. Fossil collecting can be an interesting and enlightening experience and when done properly can yield a great deal of information. But as you can see, finding a fossil out in the field is one thing, but getting it all back together again is quite an ordeal and requires a lot of patience and expertise. Years of cooperation between faculty, students, administrators, and friends were needed to produce the Mosasaur exhibit you see today. We hope you'll enjoy the GSC Mosasaur and that your trip to the museum has been both educational and entertaining.